Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, today's Grand Rounds is a special one uh, for the Division of Nephrology, um, and we've invited an excellent speaker. This this Grand Rounds is a uh, uh, John Cuneo, John Richardson a Memorial Grand Rounds. I won't uh, uh, spend too much time. I just want to say that uh, having known both of these men, I'm probably the only person here that actually knew both of these men. These were two nephrologists uh, who were uh, worked closely with the University in Jackson in their early years, went into the private sector and uh, uh, delivered really in the early days of nephrology outstanding care to patients with kidney disease in South Florida. Um, at the time of their passing, the uh, community, uh, since they were so beloved, had decided to raise money to support this lectureship, which had been going on for over 20 years. Uh, for both Dr. Richardson and Dr. Cuneo. Uh, and it's a fitting honor for both of them because they were both the major contributors to the care of patients with kidney disease. Uh, I will also add that Dr. Richardson, when I was a house staff officer myself and in my early years, uh, he would come, and despite being in private practice, uh, to medical grand rounds every single week. They were held at the VA and he would be there every Wednesday at noon at medical grand rounds and then would go back to his the private community and deliver care. So he was very linked. Uh, to this uh, department and to the school, and both men were. So uh, I'm honored uh, that we have an outstanding speaker uh, to give this lectureship today, and I will turn it over to our chief uh, who can uh, uh, introduce her. Thank you. Hi, uh, how's it going, everyone? Uh, uh, my name is Quentin. I'm one of the current my chief medical residents at the University of Miami in the Department of Internal Medicine. Um, today, I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Leslie Inker as our grand round speaker today. Um, Dr. Inker is a professor at Tufts University uh, School of Medicine. She's an attending physician in the William B. Swartz MD Division of Nephrology at Tufts Medical Center and a medical director of the Kidney and Blood Pressure Center at Tufts Medical Center. Dr. Inker received a BA in Psychology at Mac McGill University in Montreal, Canada, her MD um, degree at McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada, and her MS degree at Tufts University Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences. She completed her internal medicine residency uh, training at McMaster University, clinical nephrology fellowship at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, and her research fellowship in the Division of Nephrology at Tufts Medical Center. Dr. Inker's primary research interests are in glomerular filtration rate measurement and estimation, um, alternative endpoints for clinical research of kidney disease progression, and epidemiology and outcomes related to CKD. Dr. Inker is an investigator on several trials of kidney disease progression. Dr. Inker has worked with the National Kidney Foundation leadership on multiple public health initiatives um, for CKD um, in care in the United States, including being a member um, of the recent joint NKF American Society of Nephrology Task Force, um, which aims at re reassessing use of race in diagnosis of CKD. Dr. Inker is the inaugural chair um, of the steering committee for the NKF, uh, NKF uh, patient network, the first national kidney disease patient registry. And today we have the privilege and honor of having Dr. Inker present on new creatinine and cystatin C uh, based equations to estimate GFR without uh, race. Um, it's with my greatest pleasure to welcome Dr. Inker to the University of Miami. Uh, Dr. Inker, everyone. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here. It was a pleasure meeting all of you this morning and a pleasure meeting Dr. Richardson's nurse, the initial nurse who started in the dialysis unit back here in 1960 and his daughter. And just to understand the dedication of physicians who preceded us at really caring for patients and paving the way for the uh, the changes that we have today is, is, is just an honor to be here as part of this legacy. Also an honor to be part here because I believe the NKF is also uh, um, sponsoring the rounds. And as you'll hear, I've been very much involved in the NKF work and this the, the what I'll be presenting is a small segment of all they do for patients with kidney disease. So thank you so much. And I hope we have a lot of time for questions because it's been a really interesting time and I'm sure you all have thoughts and I'd love to hear all of them.
I just need to click on it. Okay, let's see. Let's see, can I do it now? Yeah, okay. So first of all, our take home messages, uh, there are new equations to estimate GFR from Kratin and Kratz and Staffen that do not include race and are ready for immediate implementation. Secondly, enduring change happens after careful listening to all perspectives and to the data and into consideration of all consequences with the patient at the center of the decisions. And finally, our hard work to eliminate disparities lies ahead. When I talk about GFR, I often start with the publications of, for chronic kidney disease in 2002. These are from the National Kidney Foundation's Hey Jokey Kidney Disease Outcomes Quality Initiatives, which uh, unified the nomenclature for chronic kidney disease prior to kidney failure, providing a simple definition for chronic kidney disease, a staging system, and an action plan based on GFR with a goal that would lead to improved care and prevent progression to kidney failure. It's also meant to make kidney disease more accessible to patients using the terms kidney, not renal, and disease, and not insufficiency. I don't know where all of you were in 2002, but I was just finishing my clinical fellowship and came over to Tufts to do a research fellowship with a goal to evaluate the impact of these guidelines. We set up a whole quasi-experimental design to look at states where the GFR would be reported by clinical labs compared to states where the GFR would not be reported by clinical labs. But we couldn't do that experiment. It took off just so quickly. The idea of having the eGFR, the estimated GFR, instead of creatinine as a way to look at the severity of kidney disease really resonated with what was in people's uh, in care of patients. And so we weren't able to do the experiment, but other studies uh, since then in such places like Ontario, which has pro province-wide data, was able to show that the care of patients improved with the initiation of the guidelines and GFR reporting, particularly in populations who would be advantaged from having GFR or not creatinine, such as women or the elderly where creatinine is not a great um, marker of kidney disease. But reporting of GFR did did heighten the focus on the need for more accurate estimates of GFR range, which were not available at the time of our publication of the guidelines. But this is not where I want to start my story today. In the past year or so, people have asked me to start a story with why was race included in the GFR estimate equations in the first place? And this is data from the MDRD study, which is the Modification of Diet and Real Disease Study. And I learned last night that the University of Miami was a site for the MDRD study. So some of the patients, your patients who are actually still taking care of Jay are actually dots in this graph, which I always like when I see patients from a clinical trial, I always really make a point of thanking them for their, their time. It's just enormous impact on the whole field. And I think the MDRD study was just such a wonderful example of that. But what this study, what this graph in particular is showing you is that on the x-axis is, is GFR and on the y-axis is creatinine. And what it showed is that for the same level of measured GFR, black individuals had higher levels of creatinine than their white counterparts in the study. And so the investigators of the MDRD study equation said, in order to provide the most accurate estimates of GFR, we need to include a term for black race to get unbiased or no systematic error of the GFR in each race group. And I think this is a really important part of the story to tell as it often confused that the inclusion of the race term said there's a difference in organ function. And in fact, this is not the case at all. We've done a separate study looking at measured GFR in black and white communities in Baltimore, and there's no difference in the measured GFR. This is simply a non-GFR component to the creatinine and itself has no meaning for health. The goal here was to include, to develop an equation that had the most accurate estimates in all individuals. And other people have asked, well, you know, race, self-identified race is, this, is a social construct. What if you use the more biological form of ancestry? And so these are two studies which looked at that question. The first study uh, on, the, on your left looks at uh, data from Mount Sinai in New York where they have the proportion of genetic African ancestry on the x-axis and on the y-axis is the amount of creatinine. And the different color dots represent uh, the self-identified uh, race group. So the, in the red is, is the self-identified black race group. 
And what you can see is that the level of creatinine relates to ancestry and, and does correlate with the self-identified race group, su suggesting that ancestry and the self-identified race are related in terms of the relationship to creatinine. And similar studies were shown on the, on the table on the right, which is a study from Cardia, which also showed that people with a greater proportion of African ancestry had higher levels of serum creatinine. But this too, it's not where I want to start my story today. I want to start my story in, in, on June 17, 2020, with the publication of this paper, Hidden in Plain Sight, Reconsidering the Use of Race Correction in Clinical Algorithms. And, and Dr. Vias and her colleagues in their perspective said, called a GFR is one example of the algorithms that need to be changed due to the inclusion of race. And to be fair, the story started much earlier than this. There have been many that have been calling for a reconsideration of the use of race in medical algorithms, including GFR. But it was this article that really generated the call for change. It was published during the time of race and recognizing so many of our communities were, were experiencing that it was only in this context with this question finally got the national attention that so many have been calling for. And in the article, the authors say, they, many of these race-adjusted algorithms guide decisions in ways that may direct more attention or resources to white patients than to members of racial and ethnic minorities. And certainly this is a really important thing. And so we need to think about, is this the case? Does GFR help with this or, or impede on this in this matter? And certainly of all forms of inequity, injustice in health is most shocking and then is humane because it results in physical death, the words of Martin Luther King. So this is a really important question and important thing for us to seriously consider. Um, as, we, as probably many people in the room, because I see a lot of nephrologists are aware that in terms of our kidney health for our black Americans are much worse than the kidney health for other for certainly a white race group, but other racial and ethnic minorities here. And this is data from the United States Renal Data System, which shows across the years on the, across the years on the X axis, you have um, black Americans have a much higher proportion of kidney failure than compared to the other race groups. Um, there are many reasons for this. Some are, some, some are biological, some are genetic, but there's also related to the kind of care that's given. This is also data from the United States Renal Data System, which looked at the um, proportion of uh, people within each race group who had seen a nephrologist prior to the onset of kidney failure. In blue is that uh, people had no uh, kidney care prior to the onset of kidney failure. And you can see people in the black race group at a much higher proportion compared to, uh, compared to the other race groups. So there is a component of care that is or in this group and, uh, and, and might be contributing to the disparities in kidney health. And so we go again to the, the, qu the question that's being phrased in this perspective, but right after the publication of, of this perspective, other questions were raised. And here's, and a, and here's a series of uh, references here, but the, all of these papers basically asked the counter consideration. By using a potentially more inaccurate GFR, do we inject or even exacerbate disparities? Okay, so now we're getting really complicated. Let's try and understand what, this, what we're talking about here. So this is where we were in June 2020. The equation used to estimate GFR included four variables, creatinine, age, sex, and race. Inclusion, as I, as the term as I've just told you, provided the most accurate estimate in each race group. But some people and some institutions were very concerned about the use uh, inclusion of the race term, and they said, let's just not use it. And so they were reporting GFR, ignoring the term, and what they were basically doing is using the GFR for non-Black individuals for Black individuals. The implications of this is to lead to a systematic error only in individuals in the Black race group and lower GFR only in Black individuals. And so here, for people who like pictures, I have uh, two individuals where patient A sent out self and as a black person, uh, patient B self and as a white person. On day one, their measured GFRs are both 61. On day one, their, measured, their estimated GFR may be 61. That's only in the self-identified black individual would their GFR be lower on the next day. And we had shown this uh, in a more population-based level where we looked at what's the impact if we simply ignored the race term and applied the GFR for white individuals to black individuals and compared that to measured GFR. It's only in the 
in the black individuals that she had a huge underestimate of measured GFR. And this seems to be potentially a problem. There's, if we think about equity and we could call it as ensuring equal treatment for equal risk. And it seems to be that we're therefore not doing it by imposing an error only in one group or one set of individuals. And so we can then think about, well, what are, how do we even balance all of these factors? And so what I have here is how do we use GFR in all of our routine clinical decisions? And here is just a, a small snapshot of how we use GFR. And you can think about, okay, well, what are the benefits of benefits of harm of removing the race germ from GFR estimates, even with decreased accuracy for clinical decisions? So if the let lower GFR, like I showed you, well, maybe it's okay, that's a good thing because you could have a faster or a CT diagnosis that happens earlier. You could have faster referral specialist, increased access to transplant wait list, increased access to Medicare services, such as nutrition or therapy or CKG education, which happens at a GFR cutoff of 30. And overall, more aggressive CKD management because the GFRs seem to be lower. On the flip side, there's some, some potential harms. There's decreasing potentially approval for living donor candidates. Uh, decreased drug use or dosing, for example, metformin, which is uh, should not be used at, for a GFR less than 30, be less be more likely to be lower than 30 and less likely to be used. I think a very effective and inexpensive medication. Other medications that have helped with chronic kinesis, such as SGL2 inhibitors, or use of pain medications, antibiotics, chemotherapy, decreasing contrast agents, access to clinical trials potentially access to life insurance or disability. And even though I said that the CKD diagnosis may be good, and to falsely call somebody with a disease also has some implications. There's increased anxiety, cost of medical care, and related to diagnosis. And because the approach of dropping the race coefficient could lead to changes only in black individuals, this could lead to greater disparities, for example, in cancer care or cardiac test, testing use contracts. In my view, these potential harms are relevant and important. And the path to overcome the disparities is not to use a less accurate estimate, but to address these issues head on. EGFR did not cause the disparities they existed before, and we're not gonna solve them by falsely lowering the GFR. But not all agreed, and some felt immediate action was needed. And based on this paper, this perspective, several institutions dropped the race coefficient from computation of GFR. And this is where we were in June 2021, a heated debate and lots of emotions. What was the path forward? So I had the privilege of being part of two initiatives to help address this really important question. A CKD EPI is the Chronic Kidney Disease Epidemiology, Epidemiology Collaboration. It was a research group founded in 2003 to address some critical questions related to kidney disease at the time, including GFR estimation, and I'm now, now co-director of our research group. And the second is from our two national kidney societies, the National Kidney Foundation and the American Society of Nephrology. And I will say these two societies do not generally work together. So the fact they're able to work together speaks to the importance of the question, and I also think the strength of our community. So literally a day after the publication of this guideline, uh, Myself, along with our other CKD CKD epi investigators, said, "Well, what is the impact on individual accuracy if we drop the race coefficient?" I told you the whole population level. What happens to the individual accuracy, the level they are for a, an individual person, which is really related to how we give care? Or is there a better method than simply dropping the race coefficient? And how is this different for creatinine versus the combination of creatinine and cystatin? Importantly, we were asking, will data help us move from controversy to informed action? And so we set us, we developed a core writing group that included not just the CKDB investigators and people who've been working together for many years, but different perspectives who could give us a, a different perspective on the question given the wide range of issues that it was truly asking. Uh, the NKF and the ASN got together and established a task force to reassess the inclusion of race in diagnosing kidney disease. Uh, it, uh, six weeks later, they announced the membership of which I was very fortunate, very honored to be included. And we had a broad charge to consider all aspects of GFR and multiple perspectives. 
and they aim to make a decision by 2020. I'm not sure if they were naive enough to think that we would actually be able to make a decision in about four months, but it was only uh, a year and a little bit later that we were able to finally make the recommendation with the publication the same day of our equation, CKGFE, to have an equation that did not include race and in estimation GFR, followed 30 minutes later as per New England Journal guidelines with the recommendation from our task force to, for this equation to be used. So this is our task force. Uh, we had a really broad expertise, including but not limited to health and healthcare disparities, epidemiology and health services research, genetic ancestry, clinical chemistry, pharmacology, social sciences. We were led by Neil Paul and Cynthia Delgado in their wisdom and uh, great insights. And I really have learned a tremendous amount in how they were able to guide all of us uh, to a uh, consensus and a, a really unanimous conclusion. We were joined by two patient advocates who were true partners with us in understanding and thinking about all the evidence and the implications of all of our recommendations. We had three phases to our task force. Phase one, to clarify the problem and the evidence. Phase two, to evaluate the approach. And phase three, to make recommendations. Uh, after the first phase, and there are all of the the multiple issues that are listed there, I won't read through them. We published an interim report in JSON and AGKD, our two, two national kidney disease journals. I suspect nobody's going to ever read them, but if any of you for the non-nephrologists in the room are doing anything similar in your societies, I really suggest you do it because I think we really carefully went through all of the issues and I think it laid out a process to doing that. Um, altogether, we had two hour sessions each week from August to May, including one Saturday all day retreat. We had over 40 sessions, representation from really around the world, three community forums, and a call for open science. So all together, we really listened and we learned. Uh, one of the things we first did is say, okay, there has been one approach that people have talked about, which is simply dropping the race coefficient. This is where we were when we started our conversations. What are the full set of approaches? And let's really have a very wide lens. Let's think about everything. So we developed a, uh, a list of now 25 approaches, it's been a few years, mm -hmm. and we asked questions of all of them, okay? These aren't simple things. We said, well, if we drop the race from reporting, should we report the GFR for black or the GFR for non-black as a standard? Should we report both values? Or if we, another question we asked is, well, if we use an equation that requires specification of race and just ignore it, is that ignoring the contribution of black individuals to the GFR? And there's a long history of using scientific results from whites to blacks that should not continue. And should the approach be unified? And from a patient-centered focus perspective, we said, will my GFR be the same if I move to a different healthcare provider? We also then established a set of values and evidence. And this is one of the key things that I think our co-chairs really did in their wisdom, is there was a lot of different opinions of what we should do. They said, before we even can think about what we should do, what are our values and what is the evidence? And you could almost feel just the tension lower and we all agreed on what are our core values and what are the, what are the set of evidence. And once we're able to establish that, then we can say, okay, how do we bring our really common understanding of our values, our common understanding of the evidence to make a recommendation? Uh, we then applied all of these approaches among six different attributes. So from very technical things, how, do, how does it relate to assay standardization, uh, high throughput analyzer capability? Remember, this is something that we, how many creatins do we measure, like millions in the United States every year? This has to happen in a, in a high throughput manner. What are the issues around implementation by laboratories in a clinical practice? How are the equations developed? What's the performance compared to measure GFR? What are the consequences on clinical decisions, on medications, on clinical trials? And always having the patient-centeredness as, as one key component of this. And we evaluated all of the different approaches amongst these six attributes. And we had tables like this. We regraded them in the, the final report. And, and we really talked about every single one. Uh, you, you can see some of the little circles have two pullers because there was actually disagreement on, on these. 
but it did help us have a structured way for going through the different options to come out to a final recommendation. Oh, and, and we also, so this is just some examples of the data that were available at the time. So the, in a one study uh, published in JAMA, they said, well, what is the expected impact on black patients if simply removal of the race coefficient was implemented across the United States? That's really the only approach at the, prior to our publication that was being discussed. And they compared potential harms or benefits such as uh, kidney dosation or specialist referral. So they have, we have reviewed data like this. Um, we also reviewed data that looked at um, pharmacal equity and use of GFR with or without the race term, and looked at, for example, data um, in uh, Jason looking at the number of black veterans prescription for common medications requiring dose adjustment for GFR. So, for example, uh, here it looks at the example metformin, and 24% uh, would need to have a dose change. So, most would not, but a substantial proportion would. Um, and then in this other paper by uh, Casal, they looked at the impact on chemotherapy dosing based on the, these changes. And so although we didn't have the data across all the approaches, based on this data helped us to inform the decisions across all of the approaches. So our final recommendation was uh, you know, that the, this new equation, which I'm gonna tell you about next, the CKDFE 2021, and we reasons the task force recommended it is it does not include race in the development nor in the reporting, it includes diversity in its diverse populations, development population, was immediately available to all labs, the United States is the first line test, and acceptable performance characteristics in all groups. Um, and also the potential consequences do not disproportionately affect one group of individuals. So this is uh, our equation. Uh, published, as I mentioned, on the same day. And our, when we started, our goals were to evaluate race-free method, methods to estimate GFR and the performance compared to measured GFR. Um, we had the current, and here I'm going to get into a little nomenclature so you can understand some of the things we're comparing. So the current CKDAP equation had the estimated GFR and keratin, and it had age, sex, and race, so ASR, and it was published in 2009. We were going to compare that to the approach that I've mentioned thus far that was ad being adopted, where they just use the non-Black term for Black individuals. And so the terminology we're using is EGFR, Cran, and ASR, because those were the, the three variables included in the equation for the non-Black term. And that was also based on the 2009 equation. Uh, we had a new equation that was redeveloped or a refit without the variable for race, and that has just age sex. EG for our credit in age sex, and that's now 2021. And then we looked at the benefit of cystatin. So the original cystatin equation that we published in 2012 uh, did not include um, race, so we did not have to change it. The, two th uh, the combined credit cystatin equation that we published in 2012 did require race, so now we have the AS equation, which does not include race. In that paper, we also looked at the impact of these, all of these new equations on CKD prevalence and CKD stages in Haynes, which are relevant for clinical decision making. So this is um, actually from the supplement, but I wanted to just spend a, a few a minutes, probably less, on uh, what are the data sets that we had available. So in 2009, we had a development data set, and then we evaluated in 16 separate studies to really know how to perform. Um, when we, at the same time, we were working on looking at the impact of cystatin, and we had to have samples available. So we had a much more complicated set of which studies were in development, which validation. But I want to just to draw your attention to this box, which is what is the data set we had to validate those original cystatin equations in 2012. We only had five studies, and we only had 1,000 individuals, and we only had 30 Black individuals in that data set. And so when we wrote the paper, we understood this was a deficiency. We said, we cannot evaluate. Do we need the term for black race in the combined cystatin and creatinine equation? We do not have sufficient number of black individuals. And more generally, we do not have sufficient diverse data sets. And we recognize this in this paper. And so we actually then set aside, you know, spent the next decade or so trying to get more data, not anticipating this particular question, but understanding this was a, a really a fundamental gap in the literature and we needed to do a better job. And so when this question did come up, we were ready 
And we had our 2021 data set has 12 studies, 4,000 people, and 579 Black individuals. Not enough. I could go on about how it's, it's still not sufficiently diverse and representative of our populations in the United States, but we were better able to do that. And so I just want to, I thank everybody at the end, but this, the work that we're able to do comes from so many people doing a lot of work over the years that allows us to be ready to answer this question. This is a, from the first figure of the paper. It's very complicated. I will tell you the statistical editor actually specifically asked us to do this would not be the way that I would have shown the data. And there's a simplified version that's gonna be available and up to date if you ever are looking at the data again, hopefully much able to do that. But let's say this is what it showed. So let's take a look at it. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna zoom in on one of the boxes and then just show you what these are. So on the x-axis, you have the estimated GFR, and on the y-axis, you have the measured GFR. And each of the dots are an individual person, with the uh, green dots being Black individuals and the non-Black individuals being in, in orange. The line of identity is the Black line in the middle. And the goal is that the, the line through the orange dots, the line through the green dots would all be along the line of identity. That is overall for the population, the estimated GFR is equal to the measured GFR. In other words, there's no bias, no systematic error between measured and estimated GFR. And as you can see here, the, there is a systematic error in the, in the green line, which is the black, represents the black individuals. And this is the ASRMD. We simply drop the race coefficient. Uh, we also, what you can also see on this graph is our measure of accuracy, that individual accuracy that I mentioned earlier, uh, which is an agreement between 30% of measured GFR, which is an indication of all those big, big outliers, which are really influence clinical decisions in a way that's is meaningful. And what we've also added here is agreement within measured GFR categories. Uh, what is the concordance between estimated and measured GFR? for a GFR category, which is also relevant for clinical decisions. And so overall, the results is that the 2009 uh, CKDFB ASR had no systematic error in both groups, the smallest difference between race groups. We simply drop the race coefficient, we get error only in black individuals with bigger differences between race groups. The combined equation, the new equation, the 2001 equation, which only used AS, has a small error, but equal in both race groups. There was slightly worse accuracy in the non-Black individuals, but at levels considered acceptable for clinical practice, which is just, uh, defined as a percentage of estimates within 30% of measured GFR of 80 to 90% by KPGO. And compared to EGFR, Crownin, and Cystatin, the combined equation leads to improved accuracy in both race groups with less different between the race groups and all metrics. Uh, this is actually a figure that was in the task force report. We, we, we provided the, our data to the task force to, to put there, but it's a nicer display than what we have in the, the New England Journal paper, which basically shows the implications of the different equations on the clinical decisions. All of those clinical decisions I showed you in the benefits and harms, what is the difference between these? And I, I'm not gonna go through the, the, the in great detail, but in general, at levels of six GFR between 60 and 89, there's impact on diagnosis, more aggressive management, living kidney donation, drug dosing, and there's less of an impact in, uh, uh, in, in, black, in the black individuals compared to the simply dropping the race coefficient. Uh, at lower levels of GFR, there's implications for nephrology referral, Medicare benefits, drug dosing, contrast agents, and these are an absolute number, so the bars don't seem high, but again, a smaller difference to 2021 equation. So what is some follow-up in the past year? Um, there's been lots of research. Let me just give you a very small snippet of it. Uh, first of all, there's been investigation, and thus far now, it's still only simulations to evaluate the impact of the new equation. And it's true, these are just simulations of what could happen. The question is going to be what we all do in our practice. And that's going to be time will tell, and we'll have to do retrospective analysis from clinical data. But in general, these seem to show on clinical clinical care decisions and epidemiology what we had framed in the NHANES data included in our 
in our data set. Um, we've also just, we have a paper that submitted that we did looking at the clinical effect, the impact on using the new GFR equation on the treatment effects in clinical trials. Um, separately, in other investigations, I work a lot on looking at how we use GFR and changes in GFR to look at endpoints for CKD progression. And there's a lot of concern, a lot of questions that the new equation would lead to different impact and that therefore they would have to not use this equation or look at changes. And so we showed there was no difference at all. And then we also looked at risk. Uh, this paper here was on risk was published in JAMA. We actually all wanted it to be included in the original New England Journal publication, but the editors thought it was too complicated to have everything together. And so we put it as a separate publication. And so what this shows here, these are uh, graphs which show the risk of kidney failure with, uh, with placement therapy, uh, what we used to call ESRD, associated with the level of GFR in black and non-black participants for different equations. So on the top left, you have the original equation. And again, in green is the black individuals and the orange uh, is the non-black individuals. And the red line represents the difference in risk between them. And here you wanna see a difference because black individuals do have a higher risk for kidney failure. And you want that to be the GFR as a measure of risk to reflect that the reality. When you remove race from the equation here, it, it takes away that difference. Uh, the bottom two graphs show the statin on the left and the combined equation on the right, which maintains the risk gradient. And so the conclusion that the authors made in the paper is that these results suggest that the combined equation, which is also known to provide the most accurate estimate of GFR, is preferable to the eGFR equation without race for assessing racial differences in risk of KFRT and mortality associated with low GFR. Uh, other follow-up since the publication has been the tremendous of work, particularly from the National mm -hmm. Kidney Foundation on implementation of these guidelines. Uh, their success or their, their work is, is not because they started it just at this time, is that they have had a longstanding relationship with the clinical chemistry community to engage them to help implement all sorts of initiatives for CKD care. Uh, so uh, just a few months after our publication, I worked with the laboratory engagement group and Greg Miller, who's the first author, was also on our task force. And we worked with the other laboratorians and the clinical chemists to have a paper in clinical chemistry as a guidance to help clinical chemists to implement this in their labs. Uh, just recently in uh, JAMA, just a few weeks ago, there was actually a survey saying, how are we doing with implementation of the guidelines? Let me just give you a small flavor of it. So this is in March 22. So just a few months later, the College of American Mythologists sent out a survey to about 6,000 labs. And uh, the, the actual denominator that was reflected in this study is uh, the 3,700 US labs that had non-duplicated surveys. And they asked five questions. Here's just two of them. So first of all, they said, well, how your lab adopted the CKDFE 2021 equation? And at the time, about 30% of labs had started, had implemented it. And here I'm breaking it up by all labs and then showing you for the academic hospital labs and for non-hospital labs. And actually there's market coherence amongst all of those different labs, which is interesting to see. So about 30% of the time had, which I thought was actually pretty good for just a few months after the, the publication of the equation. And of the people who are no are unsure, they asked, does your lab plan to adopt the 2021 equation? And so about 25% uh, had planned to do it before July 1. Another, I think it was about 10% up by December 22, which is where we are now. Slightly after that, but, but many were unsure. And it just highlights, well, I think there's two things. One is that it's actually not bad. About 50% of labs implementing them within a year is actually excellent when you think about the slow process of implementation of any recommendations in medical practice. But there's a, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, this is a, um, maybe one of the most important take-home points in terms of what you should actually do in your clinical practice. And this is something I've not talked a lot about. I just mentioned cystatin. So just in case the non-nephrologists don't know, cystatin is an alternative filtration marker that is less related to muscle. And so is recommended as a confirmatory or supportive test for estimated GFR. 
And this is a figure that we've used to say, well, okay, well, how do you incorporate cystatin or other confirmatory tests in the evaluation of GFR? So we, we say, okay, we have an initial test from Cranon and Cranon's ordered in all metabolic panels. You're gonna get it a lot. You're gonna assign a level of GFR in the stage of kidney disease. And then you're gonna think about, is the Cranon gonna be a good marker for my patient? Do they have an amputation? Do they take creatine supplements? Are they very sick and frail? Is that gonna be a good marker? And does my clinical decision-making rely on the GFR? Am I giving them chemotherapy? Am I making a decision about initiation of uh, dialysis or transplant or kidney donation? And if, and if so, then you would um, perform a confirmatory test to assess their consistency and then, and then based on that, design on the clinical action plan. And what are these confirmatory tests? Well, the estimated GFR from front and cystatin is the most accurate estimate. You could do a measured GFR, uh, for example, plasma clearance of iohexol uh, or urinary clearance of iothalum is also available in some institutions. And you can do a measured clearance of a creatinine from a timed urine collection. I will tell you, I, I'm actually reasonably pro uh, timed urine collection. I think there's a value to it. Um, in, in talking to, I'm on a guideline group for the revised guidelines for kidney disease, and there's a lot of concerns about time during collection. So you have to do it well if you're gonna do it. And then I would also add that because of the slight, in, slight greater inaccuracy in non-Black individuals with the new equation, I actually think there's a greater role to think about the combined equation even up front if you know you're gonna make a clinical decision that's gonna rely on GFR. Uh, so what are su suggested indications for cystatin C testing? This is also a slide of Paul Kulescu. I didn't mention him earlier, but he is the now past president of the National Kidney Foundation. And uh, so first of all, you can, if the creatinine is close to cut points for clinical decision-making. So if you're diagnosing kidney disease at a level 45 to 60 and they don't have markers of kidney damage. So if their GFR is 55 and they have no albuminuria, do they have kidney disease? That's reasonable to confirm that diagnosis. Or if it's higher, uh, but you wanna confirm the absence of chronic kidney disease or settings in which the level of GFR has an important impact on care. And as I mentioned the two already, or conditions associated with non-GFR determinants of creatinine. And what are these? Uh, so for example, you can think of uh, settings in which the serum creatinine generation is low and the frail, inactivity, malignancy, cirrhosis, HIV, or vegetarian diet. Now, uh, it's harder to know what the non-GFR determinants of cystatin are, but many of these are also related. And that goes back to, you can't just say the cystatin is better, but the recommendation really is to use the combined equation to get the most accurate estimates. Um, in, it, or you could look at where the serum creatinine generation is high, weightlifting, meat diet, protein supplements. And here I would say actually probably cystatin is better just empirically, but there's actually no evidence for it. Or in with drugs that inhibit tubular creatinine secretion. And again, here it might be that creatinine is not gonna be helpful at all. And you would wanna go to a completely different filtration marker. Um, one final, and I know it's been a lot of data. So just one final slide, I just, I added in the last minute because I get this question a lot. And I think it's often assumed that cystatin is a better marker. If you don't like your creatinine, you, you look at your patient, the creatinine is not gonna be a good marker. It, I get a very different result from cystatin. Cystatin's got, that one's gotta be, give me the right answer. So we did an analysis and we said, okay, if the, there's differences between creatinine and cystatin, which of, the, which of the estimates are better? Uh, so here we're looking at, let's say you have your estimated GFR from creatinine and your estimated GFR from cystatin are consistent to give you the same answer. Well, then that makes sense. It doesn't really matter which equation you use, whether you use the creatinine equation in green, the cystatin equation in orange, or the combined equation in purple. They all give you very little systematic error, really little bias compared to measured GFR. Well, what happens if you're, uh, if you're, if you have big differences where your cystatin is much lower than your creatinine? And this is the kind of classic example of the frail, frail older person. Here too, as expected, the creatinine in, in green gives you a big overestimate of the GFR. But here, which I think was unexpected is that the cystatin gives you a big underestimate of measured GFR. 
and the one in the purple, the combined equation remains the most accurate. And we see a similar pattern where the cystatin is much higher than the creatinine, where two, the, the, the one in the purple, the combined equation is the one that's, that's closest to giving you an unbiased estimate. So let's turn back to the question about disparities. And this is a editorial published in the Annals of Internal Medicine by Dr. Ojo. And he said, and he look, was looking at the impact of the, this new equation on would it help disparity. What he says is these enduring health, kidney health inequities in black persons have been with us for decades. And the effortful tokenism of revisions to GFR estimate indications will have no material significant effect on kidney health inequities experienced by black patients with CKD today, tomorrow, or decade from now, even with universal adoption of the new CKD equation. The solutions and productive target of efforts to achieve racial equity and kidney health lie in improving our healthcare and public health systems, not fine tuning the estimating equations for GFR. And I 100% agree. I, I mean, I think this is necessary work. We had to do it. I'm an extremely strong proponent that we should use and implement this and everybody should use this and we should move on with, uh, even with the slight inaccuracies, we should figure out how to do a better job of estimating GFR. But our hard work to, to address disparities lies ahead. Um, this is a little figure which doesn't even get at the scope of the problem, but we think of addressing health disparities and kidney health. There are so many factors which affect disparities in health or disparities in healthcare, and to really have health equity, we have to address all of them. There is much work to be done. Uh, real change, enduring change happens one step at a time. And so I'm a slightly more optimistic than Dr. Ojo, and I said that I hope this is just one step, the first step along the way. So let's go back to our take home messages. There are new equations to estimate GFR from fat and fat and fat and C that do not include race. And they've been recommended and are ready for immediate implementation in the United States. And I'm very glad to hear that you have implemented them here in the University of Miami. Uh, enduring change happens after careful listening to all perspectives in the data and consideration of all far reaching consequences with the patient at the center of the decision. And as reflections that I've learned by this process and in, in working together with my task force colleagues and those the CKD and investigators. I would learn that sometimes one must uh, slow down in order to speed up. Listening is science. And if we want to go fast, go alone. If we want to go far, go together. And finally, the hard work to eliminate disparities is ahead. Drivers of disparities are multifaceted, many of which are exacerbated racism. Changes in GFR cannot be replaced the hard work necessary to eliminate all of those drivers of disparity. And just a huge thank you to everybody. Um, I just want to end with what I wrote to my colleagues in the division on the Thursday that both papers were published. I think we can all be proud that nephrology is the first medical specialty to address race-based calculations in a data-driven way with a solution that is both scientifically rigorous and inclusive. Our work in CKDFB was initiated independently of the task force, but a strong and close community allowed us to work collabor collaboratively. And the collaboration nephrology are uh, very widespread. Thank you to the NIADDK for funding us since 2003. Our collaborators who provide the data and samples to address these questions. Our co-authors in the CKDFB paper and my members of the task force are uh, CKDFB investigators. And uh, with a very large gratitude to our CKDB founding director and now my co-director, Andy Levy. And I'm delighted to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Do we have the lights on? Yeah. Thank you. There we go. Okay. Thank you very much for that very important talk that certainly drove home some very important points. Just a comment and then a question. It may very well be that the nephrologists were the first to really address this head on. And it's mainly because, perhaps because the pathologists have been, when they report the clinical chemistry tests, have pointed it out time and time again. Since I was a medical student, this is the way you look at it. Clearly, white blood cell counts, many other things could be, but aren't acknowledged uh, in, in that way. Um, so just, just an observation. But, but my question is, 
when we use self-definition of race, clearly black is a very large term, especially here in Miami. We have Caribbean, African, and within the Caribbean, African, there's so many sub subsets. So at what point do we no longer have to, can, can, do we no longer use the descriptive term black to be inclusive? And maybe you were hinting at the social determinants of health in one yeah. of your last slides and, and get, get away from that completely and just look at the social determinants. Well, it's, it's an excellent question. Of course, you can only, from a data perspective, you need the data in order to answer that. So we actually looked at whether this, social determinants of health that had been collected in the MDRD study and actually we did in CRIC2 could explain the black race coefficient. And they, they did not actually at all. Now, the problem is, is it just how they were collected? They were collected a long time ago. So they looked at income and education and marital status. Is that enough to really reflect all of the different true social determinants of health? And so part of the struggles with answering that question is how do we get data that's sufficiently rich enough to be able to answer these questions. It's a tiny point, an excellent question. Yeah, I, I, I think the EMR today is recording those things, but it's up to us to make sure as clinicians, when we see the patients that we're recording yeah. all of that. Any questions from the in-person audience? Yes, please identify yourself and hear it. Hi, I'm Tali Elfasi in the uh, Division of Nephrology Hypertension. We touched upon this briefly in our discussion, but are there any other studies showing accuracy of EGFR measurement in other populations, not non-Hispanic, black and white? Uh, yeah, lots. Are you asking in particular? Just, just the accuracy of EGFR measurement in other ethnic minority populations. So in the United States, there uh, in the United States, there's uh, there's I, well we mentioned this earlier, so I'll say that aloud here too is that it's a huge problem. I think there's been no studies of measured GFR in Asian Americans. Of course, that's a huge group, but there's like literally none. Uh, we tried and were not able to to get that funded. In CRIC, there's some studies of Hispanic individuals, and it's not it doesn't show great differences. Uh, if you're ever interested, I have that as part of our preliminary data and that grant I mentioned to you. But there's not a systematic way in the United States. Outside of the United States, there are more. There have been studies in China and Japan, which actually show different results. And so some of the conclusions are that there are differences in measurement methods or assay methods rather than true differences. We're not, we're not really sure. Um, in Singapore, which is a very multi-ethnic or a country that shows that Sassadin seems to be more consistent than Kratin amongst different uh, ethnic groups there. So that's reassuring. Uh, there's a study in Pakistan, uh, which actually shows that Sassadin is not as, as consistent as the, as the Kratin, but there is a Pakistan equation. So lots, lots of different ones, but not, not we need more in the United States, definitely. Hi, uh, Yelena Drexler from the Division of Nephrology and Hypertension. So uh, you touched upon a little bit the individual level inaccuracies in, in EGFR and the, again, individual level differences between EGFR and measured GFR. And I think that's very underappreciated in clinical practice. I think an assumption by many patients and providers that EGFR is just very accurate. And, and so I wonder to what extent you think that should be reported or kind of the, that inaccuracy should be quantified on a clinical basis. Yeah. It's a great question. And I think the, there, um, you might be referring to, there was a paper that came out in Animals Internal Medicine, which provided a measure of accuracy. What's interesting is that measure of accuracy is only actually for the population in that study. And that point was not well made. So can I actually have a measure of accuracy of the patient sitting in front of me? And the answer is no, because it's different. I absolutely think there should be an, a greater understanding that is not a, it is certainly an estimate. And I have to tell you, it's been funny being part of the conversations the past few years where a lot of attention got on EGFR that was not there before. And I've been so puzzled. Why do you think it's real? I call it EGFR. It's an estimate. But it, it and like I said, it got so much traction because it really spoke to a limitation of the Kranin. So people took it as a value. Now, I think we do that with all of our lab tests. The parathyroid hormone, it's hugely variable. We do, we, 
I think we're only beginning to understand that there's a lot of biological variation here, parathyroid acid variation, but we don't do a good enough job of actually understanding the uncertainty in all of our lab tests. So partly it's education. I think increasing um, cystatin availability and having the two markers might help give a better focus on that too. Thank you. Quick last question in the back. Um, good afternoon. My name is Lawrence Smith-Pease, PGY2. Glad to be here. Thank you for the talk. Um, you mentioned earlier that this is ready to be implemented nationwide, and I think you said it may be starting from private, also with some hospital institutions. Um, how do you foresee this changing the landscape? Is this going to be something happening soon throughout the country? Is it going to take a while? And what barriers have you seen or heard about preventing that? Yeah, implementation is 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 very slow in most things. I remember one of the things I learned first as a medical student is implementation of beta blockers post MI and how slow that was. So this seems a little bit easier as that could be done. You have to speak to the laboratorians more than, than us. We were actually just having a conversation with this on the email with the laboratory engagement group is who to work for now. Okay, we got about 50% of labs by 22. Where, how do we get the next 50 or you know, how do we have that? And whether we work with the College of American Pathologists, the Clinical Chemistry Societies. So those are the kind of the ideas that are, are, are recognized. Um, all of you here, hopefully you're some health staff here and you know, gonna go to other institutions. And that's why I'm so happy to be able to speak to you all here and hope that you'll be the voices and help post change. And we're very happy that you're here, Dr. Eicher. Thank you very much for that presentation. I wanna thank the Cuneo Richardson family for sponsoring today's lecture. And I also wanna thank Dr. Philip Mendel, who is in a, a gracious gift to the Department of Medicine for Education has uh, sponsored many of the lunches that you have today. So thank you very much, everybody. Be safe, have a happy